In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1 says this, and it says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I've got my easels here. I wish I had one big long one, but I don't, so I'm going to use this this morning and just give you guys some understanding of what we're doing. Now, I have a <clears throat> a degree in primitive art, so in other words, my stick figures are really kind of vague, but God created the heavens and the earth. He created mountains, and he created valleys. He created the sea. I especially like mountains. I especially like the snow cap part of it. He even created birds and things that crawl on the ground. He created everything. In the midst of this creation, on the sixth day, Scripture tells us that he created man. He created man, Scripture says, in his image, and I'll talk about that here in just a second. He created man, and he understood that man had a job to do. He gave man the job to name all the animals in the garden and to be ruler over that garden and to subdue it and take charge over it. But he realized that man was not complete. He looked at man and said, you know what? I can do better. <clears throat> So he created woman, woman. I don't know why he called her woman other than her job is to woe the man. Whoa, 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 whoa. And it seems like they're always doing that. So he created the female also, and I will put her hair here. But the man had a bigger smile on his face because the woman was so beautiful. He created them, and I'll look at this scripture in just a second to show you some insight to that. But he created them to have dominion over the earth, to be the highest life form, and to name all the animals, and to live and rule and reign. That's what he created them to do. But the enemy came in and sought his way in in the form of a serpent. Now, I, like I said, I'm not a very good uh, drawer, so I'm gonna, uh, hang on, he's got a sharper tail. Okay, I'll do it like this, in a, in a tongue. The enemy came in in the form of a serpent and he deceived the woman. He deceived Eve. And in turn, Eve brought the fruit. He said, listen, there's two, there's two trees I'm gonna place in the garden. God said, there's two trees I'm gonna place in the garden. <clears throat> one tree is the tree of life and one tree is the tree of good and evil. And he said, in those trees, I want you to not, eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I don't want you to eat from that. But yet the enemy deceived Eve and tricked her into eating in that. And she brought the same food to Adam. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, scripture says that Adam was there. So we can't put the blame on Eve. <clears throat> we have to also put the blame on Adam. And as you see in scripture, we know that the sin came through Adam into the world. And I'll explain that here in just a second. But we see that sin came into the world and because of sin being in the world, now we have this issue and this problem that we have. In Genesis, the third chapter, in the 22nd verse, here's what the scripture says. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife Eve and clothed them. Jesus, or God came to talk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day and when he called for them, they hid themselves because they were naked and they got fig leaves and sewed them together to try to hide themselves because they felt shame because they were naked. And God says, who told you that you're naked? And he knew right away what the issue was. God knew it all along. But scripture says that he actually made the first garments for Adam and Eve to wear. He made garments of skin. How did he make garments of skin? He made garments of skin to clothe them, to cover their shame, to cover their sin. How did he do that? Jewish history and legend says that he took, uh, took lambs that he killed. He killed a lamb and he took the skin of that lamb and he made garments for Adam and Eve to wear. He, he was the first one to draw blood. He was the first one to kill a lamb, to provide a covering for the sin, an atonement for the sin of Adam and Eve. This series we're going through and we're talking about the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. As I was growing up in church, 
I always thought the Old Testament was what happened before Jesus was, and then now that we're in the New Testament, all the Old Testament has gone away. Really, all we had to deal with was the New Testament. But as I began to study and go through theology and seminary, I found out that there is a connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament. They are integral. They are important for us to see the plight of mankind from the Old Testament into the New Testament. So this morning, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, in this lesson, I'm going to talk about the, the redemptive history of the world, the redemptive history of mankind, the redemptive history of the Bible. I'm going to connect the Old Testament and the New Testament and show you how this redemptive history works. And so here we are. So the first redemptive thread that I want to talk about here is this thread of covering. It's the thread of covering. Here's, here's the first redemptive The redemptive thread is this. God uses the shedding of blood to cover man's sins. We'll talk about more about that here in just a second, but we see that redemptive covering, that redemptive thread. Baby, did I not bring in that 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 cable? That I must have left it back there. I I apologize. I'm sorry. My wife is she awesome or what? Look at that. Please give her a. In Scripture, if you'll keep reading with me a little bit further down, I want to show you I failed to put it within within the notes here. But let me jump down into the third chapter, into the, the 21st verse. And it says this, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam, and he clothed them. Thank you, sweetie. Just more of an illustration that we're using here. We're going to talk about this redemptive thread that's going to go through this whole process, and I'll just lay it right here as I talk about uh, these different areas, okay? Um, as, as we look here in this scripture, uh, I've, I failed to record this one portion of scripture here, but let me see. Adam named his wife Eve because... She would become the mother of all all the living. And I apologize. There was an important scripture that I wanted to to put in here, and I just uh, I I failed to to recognize it. It's important for us to understand the the origin of, of Adam and Eve. Scripture tells us, and I failed to write it down, but let me tell you what it says. Scripture tells us that God created man in his image, created mankind in his image. Male and female, he created them. Pardon? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Verse number 26 of chapter 1. Then God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the seas uh, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the living creatures that move about the earth. Then God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you go into the, real, the, to the Hebrew words here, what we'll find out is that that scripture, that word for man is interpreted in the, in the Hebrew, Adam or, or Adam. Let me, let me write it right here. It's, it's, it's just, there's a separation there. And it's the word for man, but it's the word Adam or Adam, Adam. And if you break this down, what we find out here in this scripture is that we've always had this understanding that God created man in his image, right? Woman was created out of a a, a rib or out of the side of man is what we've been led to believe, but that's not what scripture says. Scripture, yes, scripture tells us that woman was created out of that, but here scripture tells us that mankind, not just man, a gender, but mankind was created in the image of God. All of mankind was created in the image of God. Not just the man and then the woman was created as some kind of subspecies that that serves the man, all right? We'll get into that as time goes by. 
But we have to understand that he created both. Now, what, what we want to ask is, if, if God's blood is in Adam, whose blood is in Eve? Is it Adam's blood or is it God's blood? Well, here we see that he uses this term mankind or man, mankind, saying that we were created in that image. So when we break this down, we, we find a couple of interesting things. First, this word ah is the first, actually the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it is the, it's called Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. A shortened version of that is also seen in the word Elohim. Or um, um, Adonai. I'm sorry, my penmanship is not very good. These, both of these words here actually translate into the word God. So, if we're going to take this logic, we see this first letter of the word A meaning God. Dom is translated into blood. So if we take these two words together, we see that actually Adam is translated into God's blood. So when we understand that, we understand that there was a blood sacrifice or there was a blood offering that had to be made to be able to cover the sins of these people. But that blood that ran through their veins was not just the blood of man, but it was the blood of God because both man and woman were created in God's image. So the first thread that we're gonna look at here and we've talked about here is that there had to be the shedding of blood that... God shed blood to cover the sins of, of mankind. Now, let's, let's go on. That was the first redemptive thread. Let's go to the second redemptive thread. The second redemptive thread, we're going to keep going into Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Keep turning with me, if you would, please. Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Genesis, the 22nd chapter, starting at the second verse. You know the story of Abraham, how he had two sons. One was a legitim legitimate and one was an illegitimate son. But the one son that he had in his old age was Isaac. And God made this declaration to him. He says this in Genesis, the 22nd chapter in the second verse. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now, think about this for a second. What would that be like to be able to take your son and take him out to a mountain and sacrifice him? Now, this wasn't uncommon and it wasn't unheard of in this generation in this time because of the paganness and because of the things that were going on, there were human sacrifices that were given. But God had a specific plan, a specific purpose in asking Abraham to take his son, his one and only son, that's important, his one and only son and take him to a place to be sacrificed. Abraham obeyed. Can you imagine what that journey would have been like as he packs his son up and he says, where are we going, Father? And he says, we're going to the mountain to, to offer a sacrifice. And, and Isaac says, well, I, I see the wood and I, I see the knife, but I don't see where the sacrifice is. And Abraham says to his son, God will provide. God will provide. Don't worry about it. And they go off into the desert, up into the mountain. And when they get up there, Abraham, and again, I'm not, I, I have no idea what an altar looks like. I'm just going to make a, a little thing here. He, he stacks up some stones and he puts on the altar, not just a sacrifice, but he puts his son. I'm going to put a frown on him. He puts his boy, his one and only son, the only son he has, and he lays him on this, this altar and he ties him up. He binds him. He ties him down. And then can you see Abraham as he stands over this boy with, with a knife ready to 
kill his only son ready to sacrifice him. Why would a God ask him to do that? Why would God ask anyone to take their only son, this son that he had waited for for over 90 years, this son that was promised to him that now he had this son, he was so proud of it, but now God says, I want you to take this boy and I want you to take him up to the mountain and I want you to sacrifice him for me because I want to be more important. I, I suppose that's what Abraham was thinking. God wanted to be more important than anything else. And he, maybe he was thinking if God could knock out everything else important in his life, that he would put God in a higher spot. I don't know. But all I know is that he was obedient and did what God asked him to do. He got up there. Whether Abraham knew that God would provide for him something else, I don't know. The scripture doesn't say that. All it says is that Abraham was willing to take his one and only son up to the mountain. And when he got up there, he took the knife, ready to plunge it into his son and take the life out of him. And when he did, he looked over and he saw a ram in the thicket. Can I draw a ram? I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a try here, all right? Uh, oh, yeah, okay, well. All right, no, don't laugh at me. And then here, this will be the horn. There we go. I don't know. <laughs> Looks like a football helmet, doesn't it? We've, we found a ram caught in the thicket. I think this is an interesting story because there had to be some preparation that went into this. As Abraham was carrying his son and coming up the side of the mountain with his son to prepare an altar to sacrifice his son, on the other side of the mountain, God had already prepared a ram coming up the other side to get stuck in the thicket. And I want you to know something. When you think that you're stuff is a surprise to God. When you think that your issues are a surprise to God, I want you to know something. While you're going through your bad choices, while you're making the decisions, while you're going through the stuff that's holding you down, while you're going through that, God's got a miracle coming up the other side of the mountain, just waiting for the right time to present it to you, to let you know that he's going to take care of the situations of your life. He is going to provide for you. He's going to take care of you. The second redemptive thread that we see here, redemptive thread number two is this. God uses a substitute or a scapegoat for the sacrifice. God uses a substitute. He didn't kill the boy, but he brought in a substitute so that this boy could live. And he provided another way because there is another redemptive thread that is connecting the, these things together. I'm going to move these things around real quickly. If, if you guys don't mind, let me, let me put this right here. I didn't have four easels, so I have to improvise. Are you with me? So we see how this redemptive thread is beginning to wind through scripture and take us to where we're going to end up here this morning. The third redemptive thread has to do with Moses. You know the story of Moses. Moses was a young boy who was born into a Jewish slave family. At that time, the Israelites were, the Jewish people were slaves to Egypt. And you know the story that Moses came and he got the people out of Egypt and took them to the land of promise. But the backstory of that was is that the king at that time saw that the Jewish people were growing in number. They, God had blessed the Hebrew people and they were beginning to grow and multiply. And he feared that if they ever got their heads straight or if there was some kind of revolt, there were so many of them, they would be able to overpower Egypt because God had blessed them. They were having children and the children were growing to be strong. So he was afraid that if, if they understood what was going on or there was some kind of revolt, they would overpower them and take over everything. So he decided every one of their boys that are born, the newborn uh, children, the, the baby boys should be killed. And so he gave orders. If a Hebrew child is born, the boy needs to be killed. But in the midst of that, there was this boy named Moses that was born and his family did not show him. They kept him hidden for about three months. And then finally, when it got to the point where they couldn't hide him anymore, they decided that they would put him in the basket and they would float him down the river because Pharaoh's daughter was down there bathing with her people, with her ladies. And when this baby came down, she took this baby in and took care of him and raised him within her family, within the kingdom, within the... the the palace there. And so now Moses shows up on the scene and Moses has a great ability. Some things happen. Now Moses is out in the desert. We won't go into a lot of this stuff. 
Moses is out in the desert and he comes to this burning bush. And in the process, he's out and he sees this burning bush. And in the midst of this burning bush, a voice speaks to him and talks to him and comes out of this burning bush and tells him, listen, I've got a job for you to do. And here's what he says. If you'll look in Leviticus, the 16th chapter, if you'll just turn over just a little bit farther. I'm sorry, Exodus. I'm sorry, let's stop at Exodus. The next chapter or the next book over, Exodus, the third chapter, the seventh verse. Here's what it says. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of the slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now God has seen the plight of of the Hebrew people, and he's coming down to bring a deliverer to help them through this process. So one of the things that he begins to start with is he brings plagues upon the Egyptian people. He brings plagues upon them, and they're devastating plagues, but Pharaoh hardens his heart, and he will not let those people go. You know the story. And the very last plague that he brings to them, let me, let me write on this one here. The very last one is where they get the Passover from. It was the death angel was to come. God told the Hebrew people to go and take a lamb, a spotless lamb. We want you to go and take that lamb and kill that lamb and take the blood of that lamb. I've even got colors for you guys this morning. Are you excited just to keep it going? Take the blood of the lamb and I want you to put it all over the doorpost of the, of the Hebrew people, of the God, people that God chose. I, I, I want you to take the blood, and it was probably a gruesome sight. You see these doors with blood that sprinkled all up and down the sides of that door as if it was covering or blocking that door so that when the death angel came by, the death angel would see that that house was protected and there was a blood sacrifice that covered them and protected them from any kind of danger or problem. And the death angel would pass by that house, but when he would come to a house that there wasn't that blood covering on that house, he would take the firstborn animal, child, human, whatever, he would kill the firstborn of that family. And this was a sign that God gave to the Hebrew people to let them know that he would cover them and take care of them and protect them. It was a covering. We talked about it back here with Adam. It was a covering. It was a covering. It's what we would call the word um, atonement. The word atonement. The word, let me write it here. If we want to break it down, it's this. At one meant. I got too many humps on that one, didn't I? At one bit. It actually means, atonement means that I am at one with God. I am okayed by God. I am, God sees me and he passes over me. God sees my sin and he, he covers over my sin. He's protecting me. He's looking past the sin that I have. That's what atonement is. And this was a sign of atonement that the, that the death angel would pass over and would not stop and wreak havoc on this, on this home. And this was what they called the Passover. And this was the process of what they did. Now, Dr. John Sperling is a friend of mine and this is his material. And he talks about the difference between a Eastern mindset and a Western mindset when it comes to storytelling. From an Eastern mindset, they see, when they hear stories, they hear, uh, when, they, when, when they pass on doctrine, they hear stories. They want uh, pictures. They, that's their process of learning. They come through that. A Western mindset, we want facts. Give me the facts. Give me the details. Give me the doctrine. Give me three points. But in, in the context of this, in the context of the, the, the Eastern mindset, the Bible is written in an Eastern mindset with stories. If God says, uh, um, I want to bless my people and those people who, who follow me, I will bless, 
Then the Western mindset says, okay, give me the specifics of that. How do I do that? Give me three points. In, in, in the Eastern mindset, it would be something like this. There was a man who had two sons. And one son decided he wanted his inheritance and he left. And he took his inheritance and he left. And he blew his inheritance on riotous living and craziness. And then he came to his senses and thought, I would be better off living with my father as a slave instead of living here in the pit with the pigs. And so he got up and he went home to his father. His father saw him afar off and ran to him and loved him and forgave him. Even though he had blown his, his inheritance, even though he had been a, a wayward child, he loved him, he brought him back in, not as a slave, but as a, a, an honored person in that family. You see, an Eastern mindset gets that. They hear that story, they get it. The Western mindset doesn't. So in that vein, we see here that God begins to tell stories and help the Western mindset understand the Eastern mindset. And in that process, he talks about a couple of, of feasts. In, in the Jewish, in the Hebrew tradition, and still even to this day, there are seven feasts, and I won't go through all of the feasts here, but there, there are seven feasts that Hebrew people, or Israeli, the Jewish people will, will follow. There are three, hang on, there are four spring feasts, and there are three fall feasts. Of all of the feasts that they do, the one feast that is the most important, it's the high feast, it's the, it's the most honored time, it's a one-day feast, and it's called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. It is a one-day feast, and it is the most holy feast. In this feast the high priest will go into the Holy of Holies and make a sacrifice for all of the people for that one year. They only do it once a year. It is the one time that he goes into the Holy of Holies, into the temple. He walks through the veil and he goes in there and he makes a feast. Scripture tells us that he prepares for months to do this. He goes through many ceremonial washings of he'll take his garments and he'll have to have special garments that are made and he'll have to go through and, and take those garments off and he'll have to be washed and cleansed and anointed and put a new set of garments on. And there are five different times that he has to do this and those garments that he took off, they have to be destroyed. And it's symbolic of his life being cleansed before he walks into the Holy of Holies. When he does walk into the Holy of Holies, it, they tell us that they will take a cord or a rope and they'll tie it onto his ankle and around his robe at the bottom, he will have bells that are tied all the way around him because if he gets in there and they find out God decides that his life is not holy enough, not pure enough, they believe that God will kill him and the only way they can get him out is to drag him out because they don't dare go in there in the presence of a holy God. And so he goes in to make this sacrifice and as he goes in, he makes the sacrifice for, for the people of Israel, for, for that nation to cleanse them of their sins, to appease this God, for, to bring his atonement, to cover the sins of, of, this, of this nation. So in the process of that, let me read you some of the things that go on here. I've got them here in my notes and we've got them on the screen. They're here in Leviticus, the 16th chapter. If you guys want to turn, you can see it on the screen there also. Leviticus, the 16th chapter. It says, this is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area. Aaron is the high priest. With a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burn offering. He is to put on the sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burn offering. Aaron is to, take, is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and for his household. There's that word atonement there. Redemptive thread number three, God provides an atonement for sin. God provides a covering for sin. Through Aaron going in and making these sacrifices, he provided a covering, an atonement for the people's sins. Because the people had sinned. Do you, listen to this. 
Do you know that Christianity is the only religion that offers atonement or a covering for sin? All the other religions, you have to pay a price for sin. You are not forgiven for sin, you are punished for sin. In many of the Easter religions and the religions that people are even in today with, with crystals and with all the good feelings and even with the occult, they wanna to try to tell you if you will do certain things, it will help your life in the future. If you'll put this crystal around your neck, it, it, if you will look at this tarot card, it will tell you about good things that are gonna happen to you and keep you from doing bad things in the future. But the problem is, is the sinful nature of mankind cannot stop from not doing good. We can't keep from doing good. We always are going to do evil sometimes. We always are gonna have sin. Christianity is the only religion that provides a covering, a forgiveness of sin. All other religions just try to help you deal with what's in the future and not deal with in the past. And I've told you that before. Why? Because Satan doesn't want you looking in your past. He doesn't want you, or he doesn't want you looking in your future. He's always going to remind you of your past. But God will always remind you of your future because you have a future. He wants to prosper you. Your past is done, and that's gone behind you. Now let's look ahead. Let's move to the future. So here in this, we see that they're making atonement for the sins that, that mankind has. Let's go a little bit further. There's a thing called a scapegoat. Let's keep reading in verse number seven. Are you guys still with me? You're awful quiet this morning. Let me tell you, in this series that we're doing over the next several weeks, we wanted to take it a little bit deeper than what we usually do. Uh, Dylan is gonna help me do this series. Dylan is a Hebrew scholar. He knows this Hebrew language and we're going to do this because we want to help you understand the, the connection of the Old Testament to the New Testament, but even as we go by, we want to help you understand the names of God. So we're going to be digging in a little bit deeper than what we usually do on this. So just bear with us. It's going to be partly teaching and partly preaching. We're going to try to do both, all right? Chapter 16, verse number seven. It says, then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot, by the lot, or by lot, as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement. There's that word again, atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. So here's what they did. They took two goats and they would cast lots. And casting lots was a way that they would have two lots and they would pick one of them. It's almost like drawing straws. And whichever one was for the goat, for the, for, they marked the goats and whichever one came up short would be the goat that was for the Lord and the other one they would use as a scapegoat. The goat that they chose for the Lord, they would take it and sacrifice it and use the blood as the sacrificial offering in the Holy of Holies. But the other goat they called a scapegoat. We've heard the phrase scapegoat. They take this scapegoat, and what they would do to this goat is that, I'll tell you, show you here in just a little bit, Aaron will come and lay his hands on that goat, and he will pray into that goat the sins of the people. He'll pray every bad thing they've done that year onto that, and that goat now will be symbolic of the sins of the nation of Israel, the Hebrew people. That goat will be symbolic of that. And then what they did, Hebrews, Hebrew tradition told us that they would then take a, a scarlet rope, a scarlet sash or rope, and they would wrap it around the horns of this scapegoat. They would wrap it around the horns and they would pray for this goat and then they would send that goat out into the desert. Now this goat now represents the sins of the people. So there's no Jewish boy that's gonna go with that goat out in, the, out in the city, I mean, into the desert. So they have to get a Gentile to come in. And he is to take this goat and to lead this goat out into the desert and to kill that goat. Actually, they would find a, a, a cliff or something and push that goat off that cliff and kill that goat as symbolic of the sins of the people completely being annihilated and going with that sending them off, off the side of the, of the mountain or of the hill. And so that is the process that we see here with this scapegoat. So what they did, they took these two goats, and let me just, let me just write it down here for you because it's gonna make sense. They would take these two goats, I'm gonna write it here. here. 
they would take these two goats and on one of the goats, they would make sure that there was a red cord. that was around the head. As they sent these goats out, it was told that they, the Hebrew people would, would, would cry the word Azazel, and it just meant remove him. Let me, let me write it here. They would just cry Azazel, Azazel, and that would mean remove him, get him out of here, let, let him go, send him away. And then the last thing, it would be a Gentile that would take that, that goat out. So we have, those, we have those four specific things that's important for us to look at. Also, I, let, me, let me write in here just one more. It, he also took the sins of the nation. Where can I write it? Let me write it right here. I forgot to put it in here. Um, okay. So there's five things. Two goats... There was a red cord. They were sacrificed for the sins of the nation. They yelled Azazel, and it was a Gentile that took them out. So we see these things that happen through this Passover, and, and this is, that, this is that, third, that third connection that we have here. So we see this process. Now let's go to the very last one. Now this is where it all comes together, and this is the fourth and last redemptive thread. Scripture tells us now as we go to the New Testament Scripture tells us of another lamb that was chosen. This lamb was chosen not by accident, but very much on purpose. John, the first chapter, as John the Baptist is in the water baptizing people, he looks up and sees Jesus walking towards him, and he makes this proclamation in John, the first chapter. He says, the next day John was, uh, saw Jesus coming towards him, and he said, look, Here's what he says, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So now John identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God. Jesus is that, second, or that, that next Lamb that was chosen. Jesus becomes that Lamb that was chosen, not just temporary, but for once and for all, there was a Lamb that was chosen, and that's Jesus. Because if we took all of the history of the Old Testament and we begin to see this thread that connected one story to the next story to the next story, we would see this thread of atonement, of covering of sins, of blood. We would see this connection all through the Old Testament. And these are just three of the stories. There are hundreds of stories that connect this process together. But they all connect to a process here in, in I'm just gonna put New Testament, they all connect to a process and the connection of this process leads to one event that changed the course of time and that was the cross. And on the cross, when Jesus Christ was put on that cross and sacrificed, he was sacrificed as the one offering that was given not just once but for all times. You see, there was about 1,300 years between the time of the Old Testament and the New Testament. There was about a 1,300-year period that all this time they had to make these sacrifices. They had to have the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. They still celebrate that, but they don't do animal sacrifices. But they had to do this, and it was for 1,300 years, they did it over and over and over again. It never stopped. It never stopped. It never stopped. It kept going. So can you imagine how excited they were when they said, listen, one day there is going to be a lamb that's slain, not just for the nation, but for the whole world. And isn't it interesting that when they took Jesus, and Scripture says that they took him and they beat him, and they, they took him from, from trial to trial to trial, and they finally got him to the trial in front of Pilate, and they asked Pilate, asked him, who do you want? Who, who, who do you want us to sacrifice? Who do you want us to kill? Should we kill Jesus or should we kill this, this criminal? And the people began to say, no, we want to kill Jesus. And so they decided there were two men. Let me show you. There were two, there were two men. One of them became the scapegoat. 
That's Jesus. One of them was set free. One of them became a sacrifice. One of them had a sin in his life. The other one was perfect. But they chose two men. And as they brought these two men in, they decided on which one was going to be the one that was sacrificed and which one was going to be set free. And then they took Jesus, and the Bible says that they beat him. And they took a crown of thorns. I should have brought mine today. I forgot it at home. But we'll show it to you. They brought a crown of thorns, and they placed it on his head, and they pushed it down over his head. And the blood began to flow, and it formed a crimson crown, a crimson ring that surrounded his head. And again, we have the crimson thread that connects even these two things together. There was a crimson ring around the head of Jesus as they sacrificed him. Not only that, but when Jesus died, he died not just for the sins of the nation, but he died for the sins of the world. When they killed him, he didn't just die for the sins of the nation, he died for the sins of the world. And as they chose him to be the one, the people began to say, Azazel, Azazel, out of here, get rid of him. He's the one we want. Take him, kill him. And they led Jesus away. And you know who the ones that took him out and killed him were the Roman soldiers. They were the Gentiles. Do you see how these things match up exactly? The crimson, the sins of the world, Azazel. It was because this whole process that had been shown in Scripture all was pointing to the one person who would give his life once and for all for the sins of mankind. That's the process that we have. So when we look at that, we see this fourth crimson thread, and it is this. Jesus is the Lamb of God who removes the sins of the world. Who removes the sins of the world. I talked just a second about atonement. Let me write it here. Atonement was a covering for sin. When we talked about atonement in the Old Testament, Jesus came and he covered the sins. He forgave their sins. He, he, he said, I will take the place of those. I'm going to cover it. We're going to, make, we're going to make skins of goats and animals and we're going to make it. But in the New Testament, it's another word. It's the word redemption, and redemption means he makes them go away. Actually, he paid the price for our sins. I heard um, <clears throat> the story of a young man who had gotten a traffic ticket, and he knew someone who was on the police department. As a matter of fact, he was pretty high up. He was one of the sergeants of the police department. And he saw this man at a gathering, and he said, hey, listen, uh, one of your guys gave me a ticket the other day. Oh? He says, yeah. He says, I was speeding, and, and I was only going about 15 over. But anyway, I got a ticket, and man, that's really going to hurt my record. It's going to hurt my insurance. Is there any way that you can fix that for me and, and take care of that? And the officer said, well, sure. Oh, man, that would be awesome if you would, if you would do that for me. I would sure appreciate it. He says, sure, I'll, I'll take care of it for you. Some time went by, and this young man was applying for the job, and they said, well, we look back in your record, and we see that you've had several tickets. And the guy says, hang on, what, what, when, when was that ticket? Well, you had a ticket a few months ago. He says, no, that was wiped clean. I don't know what that is. Because they told me that was completely wiped clean. And he went back and he called this officer and he said, listen, you said that you were going to take care of that ticket for me, but it's still showing up on my record. And he says, yeah, I did take care of it. And he says, but it's still showing up on my record. It's still there. And he says, well, yeah, you, you, you broke the law. You, you, got, you, know, you, you did the crime. And he says, but I thought you were going to make it go away. He says, no, I didn't make it go away. I, I paid it for you. What do you mean you paid it for me? He says, you did the crime. You, 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 you were speeding. You got caught. I can't make that go away. What you've done can't be reversed. 
but you asked me to take care of it for you. So I paid the $150 for that ticket so that now you wouldn't have to pay the price. You know what? That's what Jesus did for you. It would be great to think we had, we had a dry erase and we could erase all this and all my sins would be gone and that's what we've heard that's, and what we've done is the penalty for our sins would be gone. But I want you to know, you need to understand, your sin was not erased. You did the sin, but Jesus stepped in and he paid the price for your sin. He paid the price for you so that now you could live completely free of the penalty of death that came with that sin. So in the Old Testament, when they covered over the sins, in the New Testament, they paid the price for the sin. Jesus on the cross paid the price for your sin. And that's the good news of the gospel. That's the good news of what Jesus brings to us. Our sins, though they be as scarlet, have been washed white as snow. Biblical scholars don't say this, but Hebrew scholars and tradition will, will tell you to this day that that crimson cord that was around that goat's head, the Gentile would take that off and he would bring it back and he would lay it at the door of the temple where the priest passed through to go to the Holy of Holies. And when that priest would be in there doing the sacrifices, legend says that when he comes out, that scarlet thread, that scarlet cord that was piled up, that had been around the horns of that goat that represented the sins of the people, History tells us that when he comes out, that scarlet thread would now be completely white. It lost all of its scarlet color, and now that thread is white, that, that, that cable is white. Up until the destruction of the temple in about 70 um, AD, they said that they kept doing this process up until that time, and at about that time it was recorded that they said this process of that scarlet thread being rolled up about 40 years prior to the destruction of the temple, which would be about 30 AD, at some point, something miraculous happened because that cord that would be laid there, traditionally when the priest would come out, it would be white, but around the time of 30 AD, it never turned white again, it stayed red. Because around 30 AD was when Jesus died on the cross and paid for the sins of the world. So there was no need for that. So the price had already been paid and taken care of through the blood that Jesus shed for you. So here's the good news that we have for you this morning. Your sins of the past, those blunders that you made, those willful things that you made, the disobedience that you've been into, the issues that you grew up with, with family things and the things that you didn't know any better sometimes that you got into, the good thing is, is that it's not just been covered, but through the blood of Christ, the price has been paid. You're off the hook. That's called grace. And now you can walk out of here completely free from the sins that hold you down. That's good news. Do you agree with me? That's good news. <clears throat> John Sperling, as he concludes this teaching, he told a story that I have to repeat. He said when he, was a young, when he was a young boy, he had seven brothers and sisters. There were seven kids. And he said every, every year just before school started, his mom would take him downtown and all seven kids would get new shoes. They would go into a shoe store and they would sit down and all seven of them would sit there and they would come through and they would pick out what shoes they wanted. And they would come and help him put the shoes on and get the right size and John just said, I was, it was just amazing how good you felt with a brand new pair of shoes. Any of you feel like that when you get a new pair of shoes, makes you feel good? I knew my wife would raise her hand over there. When you get a brand new pair of shoes, they just look so good and you feel so good and you, you, you just feel so good. And John said, after he put on those shoes, he said, every time he'd stand up and he'd say, these are the one I want. And, and the shoe store owner, Mr. Brown would say, all right, son. You want to take those shoes off and put them in the box or you want to wear them out? And John said, every time, I said, I want to wear these out. I don't ever want to wear them old shoes again. Put them in the box. I don't care what you do with them. I'm never going back to those old shoes. I got a brand new pair of shoes and I'm ready to take on the world. Can I tell you something? That when you give your life to Christ, when you have your sins forgiven, 
The old life is put away. You don't have to go look for that anymore. You don't have to go put those back on. There's memories with those old shoes. There's stuff that I got into. There's stuff that I walked through and stepped in I shouldn't have stepped in. But I want you to know I got a brand new pair of shoes and everything has changed. Everything is different now because Christ has forgiven me. He's washed away my sins. And now I'm going to walk into a whole new reality. That's yours this morning. Step out of them old shoes and step into what God has for you. I'm going to pray in just a second. And I'm going to pray this. I'm going to pray for those of you in here who say, Pastor, I got some stuff in my life. I've stepped in some stuff before. I got some things in my life that I want out. Not just covered up. I want them paid for. I want them gone. And as long as Jesus is offering forgiveness of my sins, I want to ask him to forgive me of my sins this morning so that I can walk out of here brand new, a whole new person. And if that's you, I'm going to pray that prayer for you. And I'm going to ask you to just signify who you are. Not so much for me. I'm not making a list of who sinned and who doesn't. If we're going to make that list, every person in here would have that list. Your name would be on that list. For every one of us have sinned, probably this week. But there is forgiveness. There is redemption for you. And you can experience that this morning. I'm going to pray that your sins will be forgiven. So what I want to ask you to do just for a second is just bow your heads real quickly. Would you for me? That's just for your privacy. But I want to ask you this morning. You say, Pastor, I need my sins forgiven. I got some things that I need to have out of my life. I don't want them in there anymore. I'm ready to step into a new life that God wants for me because he paid the price for my sins so that I could have a brand new life. And all it takes is a prayer because your sins have already been forgiven, but you have to ask him to come in and forgive you. So I'm just gonna ask you this morning, if that's you, you've got some things that you want me to pray for that God would forgive you of so that you could walk out of here completely guilt-free, completely clean. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now. Raise your hand right now so we can pray for you. Yep, yep, lots of hands. 